Hey, if you're an actor at the start of your career, or if you're an actor who hasn't started at all, no judgment. But I do want you to know that it has never been a better time to get started with Backstage. Just go to backstage.com slash subscribe and enter the code word envelope at checkout for a 30-day free trial. That's 30 whole days. You can browse through thousands of casting notices from thousands of filmmakers, producers, casting directors, all looking for talent just like you. Make a profile, upload a headshot, find out what kind of projects you want to be a part of. Backstage is where you book that very first role. It's also where you book that second role and that third role and then you keep booking roles all the way up until you win that Oscar. And then you can come join me here on In the Envelope. We love a full circle moment here at Backstage. But first, you gotta subscribe. And again, that's 30 days free if you use the code word envelope at checkout. E-N-V-E-L-O-P-E, envelope, 30 days free, get those roles. And I'll see you back here when I interview you when you win an Oscar. And not wait. Welcome to In the Envelope, a podcast from Backstage, the one stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. just an actionable note that Marty would give is like, Lily, can you look like you like him a little bit more? What's nice about that is, okay, that's an action. And it allows the space for me to articulate what that would look like as Molly. It also clued me into how it was coming across on film. Not trying to get into my head, which is a very quick way to annoy me as an actor, is trying to tell me what my character is thinking. Welcome to another new episode of In the Envelope, the actor's podcast. I am your host, backstage senior editor, Vinny Mancuso. And joining us today is an actual history maker, the wonderful Lily Gladstone. And when I say history, I do mean it. Lily just became the first indigenous person ever to win Best Actress at the Golden Globes, And just a few weeks after that, she became the first Native American woman, again, ever to be nominated for a Best Actress Academy Award. This is, of course, thanks to her role in Martin Scorsese's Killers of the Flower Moon, uh, which tells the shockingly true story of a series of unchecked murders that plagued the Osage Nation in oil-rich 1920s Oklahoma. Lily plays uh, Molly Burkhart, an Osage woman whose family is ripped apart by the scheming of her own husband, Ernest, played by Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, and his uncle, William King Hale, played by Robert De Niro. Uh, It is a staggering performance from Lily, uh, one that's really built on stillness and subtle physicality. This is a well-earned Oscar nomination. Uh, We dig into all of it here. Uh, This is an episode especially for anyone who loves the uh, nerdiness of technique and acting study, but also, of course, stories about working alongside Scorsese, uh, as well as the critical input from the Osage Nation that made this movie and this performance possible. Uh, It's a great episode, a great chat. Let's get right into it. Here is Lily Gladstone. Lily, how are you doing? How is it going? Thank you so much for being here. Oh, I'm so happy. Thank you for having me. Um, this is a very exciting time, as um, mm. I'm sure many, many people have been telling you. Uh, I believe we are recording this two days after the Golden Globes, so congratulations. Mm-hmm. Thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm always curious when we do these awards seasons episodes, you know, I just love to ask what you're doing with the moments between the moments you know what is you know there's the golden globes and then there's the day after the golden globes and then there's the interviews but there's the 20 minutes in between between interviews how are you spending your time between the capital m moments uh 
honestly, I think just checking in with family and friends, you know, because there's a life away from all of this too. So you grab those little moments to to share the joy, catching up on some texts. Yeah. Otherwise, yesterday was nice and chill and got some sun, had some time with a friend, kicked back. It was great. I love that. I, I love the grabbing moments of reality because I feel like a lot yeah. of it probably, you know, feels like unreality. <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah. My favorite, I mean, like my favorite in between dissociative thing is just playing Merge Mansion on my phone. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what that is, but it sounds like something that I could waste you, many, you know, many hours on. Oh, yeah. It's insane. It's ridiculous. It's like you you make the two little like hedge clippers turn into a rake and then you got the rake and then you try to make the rake a wheelbarrow and you just keep going. And it's 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 stupid addicting. I love that. Well, maybe I'll find the time for our merge mansions. <laughs> these times. Um, I obviously cannot wait to discuss because of the flower moon, your performance in it, and everything like that. But I do need to start off uh, by saying thank you personally, because many years ago, I think it was 2016, I watched Crash Course. Uh, oh, film my production goodness. with Lily Gladstone <laughs> and learned a lot. Uh, I, I feel like That's you know, awesome. I, I do this job. I talk to directors and actors, and I feel like, in a way, I hadn't really realized since until we, we booked you on this podcast. I was like, I think a lot of that knowledge is from <laughs> Crash Course with Lily That's Gladstone. That's amazing. I love that. I was so excited to, to get be to clear do to Crash the listener, Course. Lily did a, a, a PBS, uh, mm -hmm. it was like a 15 uh, episode series where you taught, you know production what is a grip what does a cinematographer mm -hmm. do you really were like broke down what a camera does which i thought was really incredible and what was really interesting was you know i, I went back and listened to you talk about like what a director does mm -hmm. um and i think even especially talking to an actor i i think a lot of people when they're not in this they're like what does a director do you know they have the image of them holding the camera right and i feel like your <laughs> note about giving actors actable notes was was huge for me understanding what not only directors do but actors do as well Absolutely. I'm I was really, really happy when Caitlin, my longtime friend and producer of SciShow, which is an affiliate of Crash Course, it's all under the Hank Green, John Green umbrella of free online accessible education. That was the part that meant the most to me. Yeah, you know, we'd all gone through the same programs at University of Montana. I'd done theater. Caitlin had done uh, the new media arts program and most of the media arts graduates who stayed in Missoula went over to work for that great program. So, yeah, it was um, somebody who had directed me before had put those questions together. And, you know, we got to we, that one. We actually got to visit with we got to visit a bit. And so um, a former director of mine actually directed the Crash Course episode. And then the producer of the show was a director of mine, too. So that one was definitely collaborative. Well, highly recommend it. I feel like that and backstage kind of go hand in hand. Like if you need a totally if, if, if you don't want to go to college. Mm -hmm. we, got, we have a YouTube series for you that just we'll try and teach you as much as you can. I am curious, yep. you know, it, it, I, I went back and watched before this, and it's, it is comprehensive. And I'm, I'm curious how much you value knowing all of that for the purposes of being an actor. You know, how valuable is it to you to know what a grip, exactly what a grip does, exactly how a camera works, specifically when it comes to your acting? I think it's really, really helpful for everybody. It's um, you don't need to, you know, you don't need to walk in. Nobody's going to quiz you on their department, you know, <laughs> but having I really appreciated my my theater training at University of Montana for this. We took classes in lighting, sound, costumes. We got a full rounded education for what it is to be an actor and what it is, you know, the people that we're working with and the jobs that they have. And I feel like it's only made me more collaborative. That's one of the things that I love most about being on a set is uh, oftentimes in theater, it's the actor and director and stage manager for months and months and months. And then you get into tech and you, you know, if you try really hard, you can have conversations with people, but you're mm -hmm. kind of working. It's like you're kind of sequestered away from crew, but on set, everybody is hands on and is around you all the time. They're your first audience. And it's um, the collaboration of knowing Honestly, it just kind of sets your mind at ease as an actor sometimes if you're doing multiple takes to know that it's maybe it's not you. <laughs> maybe it's something with the, you know, the focus puller needs to land their cues too. Maybe the camera's trying to catch a specific lens flare. It's helpful to know what kind of resolution you're being shot on. Just, I think my favorite crash course in that whole series was uh, The Filmmaker's Army. It was based on the Orson Welles quote. 
because it really just gives you that big comprehensive set sense of how many people and how many artists are hands on to make this magic happen. And yeah. um yeah, I think uh I don't think it's like a requisite, but it just does for me, it it helps me so much because then it's not so shrouded in mystery. It's uh, it ups my game a little bit because you know how many people are working so hard, and then like just in little moments when you know somebody who's in a department that's a little bit too far away to get there quick. If you know you as an actor kind of know what the problem solving needs to to be and what you can do, you mm -hmm. know from your own lane what you can do to help everybody else. It's just it it really it creates a, a very equitable feeling set and very collaborative set. I love that. I do want to get into, you know, again, you, you mentioned getting a full education on acting. I would I do want to get into some of the more, you know, like specific nerdier details of like <laughs> techniques and stuff. And there's a few techniques sure. I've seen you talk about throughout the years. And one of them was, was Meyerhold biomechanics, uh, yeah. which uh, I'm not sure a lot of people listening <laughs> to this will understand what my, so if you could just give us a quick breakdown of what that means, I, I, cause I've seen you say that something you fall back on a lot when you're acting. Yeah. Especially that transition between theater and, and film. And I've, I've got to thank Bernadette Sweeney for that one. She, um, she was one of my professors at university of Montana and she's the one that cast me in the production that ended up making me an equity actor. Nice. But Bernadette, her pieces were very, very based in Meyerhold. And just the idea, the one that's the most helpful to me, because I, I'm pretty, nat naturally, I'm a pretty movement-based performer, having a foundation in dance, I think. But I've also just had a very strong physical response, subconsciously even. So it's so delicious in film, especially when you find the small gestures a character has. And it just, it's a helpful way of... Um, Sometimes it feels a lot more sustainable to build physically outside in and, you know, really just keeping track of what those small gestures are. And then one that really helps me is the scaling, like um, taking that gesture and putting it on a scale of one to 10 and performing it at a 10, mm -hmm. you know, which would be the fullest, farthest expression of whatever that emotion or gesture is. And then you find it's really nice for like pulling out how, Maybe this small gesture that my character found of spinning her wedding ring, you know, it's like you take that to the the most extreme and then it kind of clues you into maybe what the subconscious mind is telling you in that moment. So then you have um, a roadmap and then also scaling it back like that's the helpful bit for film. I mean, sometimes uh, depending on what the scene is and how sharp of a transition from, you know, into character it is. I know that I've kind of looked crazy to other people <laughs> before, but just doing big, whatever the feeling is and like exaggerating that gesture and then kind of sucking it back and making it smaller, then there's a clear understanding of um, kind of what that roadmap is. And like, if you go big and then can make it more minute, then it really feels like the smallest little movements convey the biggest um, moments. It's it, And it always really is surprising how, little is required for the camera you know you, you think mm -hmm. you want the eight you're like because you're not gonna you know they, they don't want a 10 but you won't see anything smaller it's like no you want like a two <laughs> maybe exactly maybe a exactly and you even find sometimes that your scale shifts it's like your your one in theater is your eight on film mm -hmm. and it's like going back even further and i would say sometimes on film level one is you're just thinking it and then there's a mild temperature shift that happens just in the eyes and the face. And then, like, in film, I feel like when I've pushed it to 10, you, I kind of save those for wides mm -hmm. because it's overwhelming. And that's that's the valuable part of understanding how the camera works, how framing works, how um, sound works, you know, checking where your mic is so you're not going to blow your mic out. Um, I mean, that's always the courtesy check when you're on stage. but. Yeah, it's uh I've found that the biggest moments that I've had on camera have been when I know it's a wide mm -hmm. and there's more of a frame to fill. Um and Meyerhold has been really helpful for that. And in terms of like, you know, using physicality to express something, using your your body to to express a feeling. I also have seen you say that in college you got really into, you know, theater of the oppressed and through mm -hmm. that uh image theater. Um, mm -hmm. And again, these are these are not tech, these are it's not like Stanislavski. This is stuff that people you know, might not know what it means. So I, I'd love a, just a quick breakdown of what that is. 
Yeah. I mean, image theater kind of does feel wed to my world in some ways, but it's the one that I've practiced the most in non-actor circles because, I mean, kind of the theory with theater of the oppressed is using actor techniques and theatrical techniques to um, tune the instrument of the actor, which is your body. If you have autonomy over that, then you have stronger autonomy over the stories, shaping the stories that shape your world. So image theater is that physical response and encouraging particularly non-actors to explore that, what that means. And then it's an outward expression of a very internal life that allows people to have more nuanced conversations about some really difficult topics or some very abstract topics that have real world ramifications on your sense of self in the world. So I've found that really helpful too, because that's a way of like really creating a sculpture, um, an image that will convey way more than words ever could. The the example that I always go back to when I've done this work has been to create dialogue where um, there needs to be dialogue. Mm-hmm. One instance was at a just a gathering that was put together by a Native student organizer and my very, very good lifelong friend, Crystal Tubals. She knew that I was we were roommates while I was uh, studying this method and wanting to apply it. And she thought it was brilliant. So she brought me in to facilitate this conversation between Native American students on campus and faculty because at University of Montana and, you know, every Montana university, a lot of universities, period, Native students had at our school the highest dropout rate of um, any any demographic So this conference was to create dialogue with faculty and professors about why that is. And um, one of the words that, you know, you sit down with a community and you bring up these words that are like triggering or that are um, significant Mm -hmm. within these contexts. So as a group, we one word that we we tackled was assimilation. And the physicalization of assimilation did so much more than any conversation could do because It was performative. It became, you know, there's this technique of uh, debate or conversation when you're really trying to talk to somebody. It's like you you pretend that it's an artifact and you put it on a table between the two of you and you talk about it instead Mm -hmm. of talking about each other. And it removes some of like the emotional weight. So the sculpture garden kind of does that because then you have this physical manifestation of this concept and then you can have people mirror and mimic and switch. And it's a way of just kind of a quick track to empathy. So for assimilation, um, the native students would do like images where they were hiding or, you know, holding their fingers out to cut their hair. And then there was a teacher who like made it look like, oh, it's a warm embrace, everybody coming together and being one. So that conversation, the other one that I thought was really moving was poverty. And Mm. uh, the teachers who had, you know, the comfortable salary would like, you know, poverty be like, you know, they'd be reaching, extending their hands down, like they're, they're giving charity or something. Um, but one of my friends, one of the students, he got himself into a half plank position on the ground and he was holding it and you could see his arms were starting to shake. And then that one really spoke to me because it was like the, the, the starkest level shift. And then, um, it was kind of cool because he was just focused. He said, it's, you're spending all your energy trying to not hit the ground but you also can't really fully push yourself up you're just chronically fatigued all the time so i thought it was interesting to place this faculty that had his hands extended like with goodwill to this man whose head was just face to the ground and like it's it was just it shows you how flat that that exchange could be and then when we had them switch (laughs) like um it was it was a very very quick way of um and it was a beautiful articulation it really cuts to the to the core of it, like absolutely in ways that would be it would take so long to describe with words. Yeah, yeah, and I, I probably shouldn't even try because just uh, they speak for themselves. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, and that's that's the actor's job. You know, there's um, I'm I'm just so in awe of every artist and what they're able to accomplish, like what writers do, what painters do. You know, we just you create. Uh-huh. You know, you deal in um, trade and abstraction, but in in deep human emotion. And trust that it will come across as recognized. You know, the, the, mm-hmm. the worry is always if I do this, is somebody be like, well, what does that mean? It's it's. But you're like, I don't know. It, it just it's just what came out of me. It's I have to trust my instincts on this. Exactly. 
the the third thing I I I want to discuss, and it kind of I mean it doesn't tie directly together, but it is this idea of finding something unexplainable through movement. As I you've talked about when you're building a character, uh, you occasionally use animal study, um, mm-hmm. which I I find very interesting. I, I've had people on this, on this podcast talk about it before, so I would love to just sort of you know get to the to the bottom of how that helps, especially in the 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 character creation process. You know, understanding a character through animal study. Absolutely. I mean, one that I can point to just so cleanly, certain women, my character spent all of her time with horses. So that was uh, human beings. You know, we just we our mirror synapses are constantly firing whatever whatever situation we're in. So it was just natural that especially because the rancher, you know, the, the awkwardness of spending so much time in isolation, like Kelly, when she was articulating some uh some of how she interpreted the rancher to me she's like it's like when i'm in a when i'm in my apartment writing for weeks and weeks and then i leave and then i kind of forget how how to interact with people again so that i i found that character a lot with not just the general animal but the individual horses you know like they all have their own personalities they all have their own characters but just like mirroring and mimicking movement sheerly just for survival around these these enormous animals that could just kick your chest in, you know, it's like, you have to be very, very aware and attuned to what their movements are and horses, like they understand micro expression. They understand small movement. And I feel like the rancher was very, very informed through animal study of the horse. And I wouldn't say that there was a specific animal that I studied for like Molly Burkhart, but the way that um, that still observational quality is uh, it's a rare thing to find in a human, but it's, it's a very specific thing to a very specific culture. And it's something that I understand and grew up around. So I always, I think when I talked about this before, I reminded everybody that animals, humans are animals too. Yeah. And our expression of humanity is so shaped by culture. And uh, Molly was a different animal. She was like a fully, she was a fully expressed and um, human being, but through the circumstances that she was brought up in, you know, culturally and outside influence, you know, what what makes these self-possessed, very like regal contained Osage women so that one was a, a people study, but it was very based in small gesture and movement and how you how you wear the blanket, how you wear the clothing. But yeah, it's uh, I think a lot of times if I'm feeling particularly stuck animal study, because every animal has a different pace mm-hmm. and animals are naturally so funny. I think a lot of comedy comes from just the way animals interact and like pause and then they like continue with what they're doing. Animals never going to try and be funny. So exactly. It's, it's comedy. Exactly. And I think that's probably what's so refreshing is their animals are so, so innately present. Yeah. There's a, there's a lot of rhythm. There's a lot of pace. There's specific movements. Um, the, my favorite animal study in undergrad was, uh, was doing arena from the seagull and I made her a goldfish in a, <laughs> in a tank with the water going down. <laughs> Love that. Yeah. I, I'm I'm curious, you know, as we sort of jump into playing Molly, playing uh, uh, doing Killers of the Flower Moon. When you're preparing for this or any role, you have all these things in your head that we just discussed. You know, all these things that you've learned, you've compiled. Is it a matter of like picking and choosing what works for what? Like, what what is your sort of how do you view your own toolbox? How do you what are you using for what, and how do you decide what's right for what? Or is it just a matter of following what comes? Yeah, it's it's that. It's a response to what you're getting from that character from the world that they come from. And Molly was such a blessing because we were in the place, you know, story, memory, time, you know, indigenous perspective is very is a very place based thing. And, you know, a lot of Molly came from the land, just being on the land with the people 100 years later. It's um, there's a transference there that you can't really articulate. And, um, but yeah, every character kind of tells you like the characters I found where I feel the, where the person feels the most disenfranchised or the most powerless. It's like, those are also the people that are the ones that fight against that the most. So I do do a lot of very like powerful breath work with that. Breath work is a really 
really quick way to getting into mania in a scene. You know, if you just are a little bit lightheaded by doing sharp inhalations and like sharp exhalations just over and over again, it'll kick you over pretty quick for when the cameras are rolling builds up that quality in your pupils that you get when you're, you know, you're a little bit heightened. Yeah. It's uh, I don't really sit down and plot out like which parts of my toolbox I'm going to use. And then each character also teaches you new little tricks. And a lot of them just, you know, the way that, I mean, the way theater, of the oppressed came together was borrowing from a lot of gameplay from indigenous communities. Mm-hmm. It's, um, and ended up working and being a very effective tool. So there are some things that um, the character will teach you each time. I've also seen you said you're a big researcher, and there was a lot, a lot of research that went into sort of before Killers of the Flower Moon. You know, there was a lot of conversations once you got there. A lot, you know, even before you started shooting, a lot of just sort of you know ingratiating yourself with the community, having conversations, stuff like that. I'm curious if there was anything specific in the research or the conversations uh, before shooting, anything like that, that particularly helped it click in your head you know how you're gonna how you're going to play this woman how you're gonna play this character or if there's Mm -hmm. anything that sticks out to you that specifically that you went oh that's very helpful you know the building blocks foundation of her came from the language Mm -hmm. because osage when i was when i first got cast um i guess the first work that i set myself to was i downloaded the osage language app and found the the orthography and i just quizzed myself. I I didn't want to teach myself too much because oral spoken traditions and languages need to be learned in community with other people. But having this set of uh, set of symbols, the symbolic system, which I love, like I think symbolic systems are really stimulating. I, uh, I wrote them out. I would listen to recordings of the language on the app while reading the orthography just so that when I walked into language class, I would have a little bit of a grasp. And just doing that, it also teaches you what the phonemes are and the morphemes are early. I knew that would be the hardest. Like Blackfeet language is the indigenous language I've grown up hearing the most. So when I learn learn a new word, it takes a minute for my body to really absorb it and just like for me to really breathe and live it. But it happens way faster because I have a sense and I've had practice with our morphemes and phonemes. But Osage was a completely different story. Mm-hmm. I was terrified for the first month because I just I didn't feel like I could make it sound like I would be fluent. I was mm-hmm. so terrified of sounding clunky and robotic. And it was just a completely different set of of syllables. And Osage is influenced by hundreds of years with uh, trade with the French and with the Spanish as well. There's elements that are very, uh, there are a lot of words that it shares with Lakota and Lakota is one of those native languages that like we all kind of know a few words from because there's been so much interest in Lakota. Um, And I actually found there were a lot of words in Osage that have kind of become pan-Indian that I hear that I just never really knew what the origin was and it's like oh it's it comes from Osage but the more fluid I would get just with the sound systems and hearing particularly Osage women speak I could feel Molly and there were even though they didn't all make it in the movie every chance that I could find I asked for my lines to be translated into Osage and I would learn the scene in Osage as well as in English I mean, of course, there were scenes that required Molly to speak English because she's with a non-Osage speaker. That was a lot of them. But the ones where it felt like it could go either way, I would ask to shoot both ways. And a lot of that was because that's always where she would show up. Is um, That's where I found her voice. And, you know, finding the voice is where you find the energy level. You know, my, Molly being a diabetic um, and being one of the first people on the planet to receive insulin. You know what the, just metering the level of energy that she would have had with this with this illness and um, the words that she would need to speak. Like I always found her, I always found her strength in, in the Osage language. So that had, a, that had a lot to do with it. Same with the dress. Like, uh, Osage clothing demands you hold yourself a certain way. Mm-hmm. After I had my first fitting and I was tied into my first ribbon skirt, um, it felt like 
you know, my spine immediately straightened. I felt four inches taller. And I said to Julie O'Keefe, the um, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. I get, I get why the Osage nation gave birth to America's first prima ballerina. <laughs> it made sense to me. I, I, I love that. I, I was just going to, I always find myself doing this, just throwing my guest quotes back out, <laughs> back at them. But I, I, <laughs> I, I, I found this so fascinating. You were doing an interview and, and you were talking about, you know, when the character feels real. And you said, you, I believe your exact words were, sometimes it doesn't happen to you, you can smell the shit on your shoes. Um, which <laughs> I love. That, that must have been for certain women. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm curious, you know, what, what the, um, the moment was for Killers of the Flower Moon where, whether it was, you know, the first shot, the first time on set, where, where it was you felt like you were there, you know, you have done all this incredible research, all this incredible pre-production stuff. But when did it, when did you smell the proverbial shit on your shoes, basically, for this movie? <laughs> I think it was um, when I was just hearing the sound of what it of what it sounds like to be around family and in community, the laughter of like my mm -hmm. sister's particularly Janae Collins. My God, that girl's got such an infectious laugh. <laughs> um, and that laugh is the heart of why when Molly gets the news that that Rita, it was Rita's house. Um, and that 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 guttural like reaction that I had, no one planned that. That was a wide establishing shot that we were going to like build a, a dolly down the stairs to like slow punch in on my face. And then after that, it surprised me. It surprised you can see all the kids in the basement. Um, just it, everything just kind of stopped. But that is because like just that moment, all I could hear was like Janae, who is actually my flesh and blood cousin in real life. <laughs> She's my family. Yeah, I saw that. And I, yeah. I, the interview, you mentioned it so casually. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. it's so interesting. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's it's significant. The common ancestor we share is really significant. But anyway, like, uh, you know, I I also talk about how I need that kind of goofiness, that lightness, that levity in a drama. Mm -hmm. I need that between takes for because I I just kind of feel like I need the one eighty. I can't live steeped in the drama or I spend it away from camera. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, that uh, I think I found. I really found that sense of who Molly was when the community showed up, when all the other actors that created the community that raised her, when their characters stepped forward. And then just that first scene with the sisters, the giggling and the laughing, that was the soundtrack that was just in my head as as Molly starts losing one by one. Like it was um, just the that echo of their laughter and the life that they all had. Yeah. That was the, always the quickest, cleanest way out of like, you know, being too in the trauma of it, too in the, too in the grief of it, just like being able to step back onto, onto set, being back into holding. And there's like, there's Osage actors there. There's one of our, one of our extras who's Osage walked around and asked every native person on set, their tribal affiliation, there were over 200 tribes represented. So it was just a lot of natives together. Just, that's always that's always a fun experience you know it's really beautiful to hear that you know that you, you mentioned that was the soundtrack i always you know it seems like that where there is of course you know criticisms of you know the the, the runtime or anything like that and i always think that like moments like that if you were going to if you needed to cut it down to like 90 minutes those was that's what you would lose but then what would you lose from the from the movie you would lose exactly you would lose the stuff later that it wouldn't hit nearly, nearly, nearly as hard. That scream that you mentioned would not hit nearly, nearly, nearly as hard. And uh, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that really is, that is an, an incredible piece of acting. And it is, it, it is so, you know, gorgeous to hear that it surprised you because it always, it always fascinates me when an actor says like 0.5 seconds before I did it, I didn't know I was going to do it. Yeah. Yeah. That one just fully volunteered itself. I love that. I do want to ask about a, a, a couple other, you know, specific moments from the film, just to sort of get an idea of like, you know, what was happening on the day, you know, just to sort of get an idea into what the whole process was like. Uh, and the first moment is something I'm interested in because you've talked so much about how important your movements are and how important living in your body is, but this is also such a still performance and there's so much silence. And I think, you know, even Martin Scorsese has mentioned how, how powerful your silences are. And there is that scene where, a storm happens outside of Molly's house, and it's it, 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 you just sit in the silence. And again, 
another movie might have cut it sooner. So I, I am curious about using silence as an actor. You know, how you approach any moment like that where you're just existing on camera. You're not saying anything yeah. and doing anything. So I'm curious about your approach to all of that. Well, silence is never, it's never actually quiet. It's so rich, you know, um, it's almost rote to say it, but that uh, idea that music and jazz particularly is as much about the pauses between the notes as it is the notes. That that sort of pregnant pause, that breath, like they're always imbued. And I think I love that scene because it does talk about how important it is to just receive the gifts that this thing is giving you. And um, stillness is something that a lot of, I know a lot of people, period, outside of, you know, the acting realm just struggle with but it's it's really magic what happens when you can sit and receive and just allow things to happen and um i mean i just i also remember going back to theater training all of the you know a lot of alexander technique deals with a lot of stillness with transition with the with short movement with um you know, or bonding with another actor if you're if you're doing like the the mirroring and like the handoff of gesture, how that that those moments get imbued when you just accept the stillness and then the movement. I think that's the thing. It's like out of stillness, really authentic movement can can arise. It's also just so important for for the processing of the action. I think um, it's one of the reasons I love Radio Lab as a podcast so much is in between these really heady, like fantastic um, discoveries that you're making while you're listening to it. You have these awesome musical interludes, these fun, you know, you have a chance to process what you've just mm -hmm. seen, what you've just heard. And I mean, that's that's kind of what art allows us to do is process things, be presented and processed. That that moment was just needed for the story. And that came directly from Osage Community. That scene hadn't ended that way originally. The script had Molly and Ernest basically taking shots together and Molly drinking Ernest under the table. But they were like, no, that wouldn't have been Molly. That that could have been Anna, but that wouldn't have been Molly. So that story came from Wilson Pipestem and how his grandmother would be in a storm. And I think just that dialogue of, you know, finding those moments where the Molly Ernest chemistry would have been rooted and that opposition, that complimentary, like, uh, you know, he feels a little awkward and the need to fill the silence. And she says, just, just be with it. And then you'll notice the, in the ending credits, that it's such a profound moment that you've just watched this slug out of an emotional, like heavy revelatory torturous, um, history you know and it stays with you and then you'll know, like in the credits you hear the rain it's quiet and you hear uh, once the singing wraps once that beautiful song wraps at the very end and you see community together intact today moving forward together you just you sit with the sound of the rain and then the rain lifts and you hear the coyotes at the end singing to each other and that was that was pretty profound. That was a really emotional moment, seeing that the last moments of the film, giving the audience a chance to sit in silence and listen to the rain and let it, what they just saw process and wash over them. And I think it's one of the things that made Molly so precious in the story, the way that she is in the film. That's be, I, that's a detail I had I had not noticed the rain at the end of the credits. That's really beautiful. Yeah, um, it's I, a I, gift. I, 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 there's so much of that in this movie where it's, you know, I, I, I've seen it twice and I think I could see it a million other times. And then we miss these, these small, these small details. And a lot of that is in the performances. You know, a lot of it is, is these quiet moments, looks, you know, uh, mm -hmm. something somebody's not saying. It's a, it's a feast for actors and in particular, I, I find. Thank um, you. Of course, of course. And I am also curious about another moment of silence in this film. It is, I believe, your last scene in the movie. It's probably not the last scene you filmed, but it is between you and Leonardo DiCaprio. You and you know, it's between Molly and Artist, and it is a exactly what we're talking about. A example of things going unsaid, but being portrayed at the same time. It is, you know, it is him saying, "No, I didn't know." Her yeah. taking that in. Um, so again, you know, when you're when you're approaching something like that, what is the discussion between you know everybody in terms of like? 
you know, what's the level? What's the, you know, what's the reaction? How much am I giving here? How much am I giving there? What's that conversation like to end up in a place where so much goes unsaid, but is at the same time said? You know, I really, um, I really credit Marty there too in pulling it back to exactly what it needed to be. And then you just, you feel the motion, you see the reaction and suddenly Molly's gone, you know, and it's so simple and so profound and it just, that's it. The finality of it because we had talked about a lot of different ways that we might've shot that, you know, in rehearsal, like as soon as he says insulin, I would stand up and leave. It was like, it was sharper. It was like more punctuated. And that was my instinct. But, um, you know, being reminded the the Molly that that Thelma and Marty had fallen in love with in, in um the rest of the film, having that moment to just really soak in those last few bits of earnest of that last betrayal, that last lie. And you know, we wanted to we wanted to keep the audience on the hook the way that um William Wyler did with the heiress, um, that moment where Olivia de Havilland, where you're you're thinking maybe Catherine will open the door to Montgomery Cliff's character, but she locks the door instead. We wanted to sustain that. That that was a big reference for that last scene. And that scene is, it's like you hear Montgomery Cliff on the outside, just like not have hasn't changed, saying the same things, you know. And uh you just you're with her the whole time. And she carries you and sustains you in that stillness you can't quite figure out what's going on in her head you think she might open the door to him again but then just the definitive lock and then go back up the stairs so um i think that was i'm grateful that that marty brought that back around and reminded just like just let it hang just let that answer hang for a minute and sit with it for a minute before you leave as i mean at that point, like Lily felt very protective of Molly, the way I think a lot of the audience does. And you just like, girl, get out of there. <laughs> you know? Because yeah. there is a moment where you're like, no, you're not going to. <laughs> you couldn't right. possibly. Yeah. It, 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 you go through a lot of emotions across, I don't know, 15 second period there. And it is, uh, mm -hmm. it's really beautiful to behold. I, I am curious, you know, since we talked about, you know, Crash Course, uh, which I just watched, there is, you do talk a lot about actable notes. I'm curious if there's a particular note. That stands out to you that sort of would exemplify your your working relationship on this film with Martin Scorsese. Is there is there is there a particular note that stands out to you all this time later? I know this wrapped in 2021, but um No. Um Yeah, I mean Marty and I would have a lot of conversations. I think the more consistent note that I would get, especially when we were steering it toward the takes that were working, because we did a lot of experimentation with this Molly Ernest dynamic early on. We weren't mm -hmm. quite sure what we were going to find, what didn't really wet ourselves to what level of complicity there was in the whole thing on Ernest's part, what level of suspicion Molly would have had. But there were a few times. It's also just like Molly being an Osage woman, like touch is a very big deal like the moment where um molly refuses to you know Ernest opens the door for her their very first meeting in the car and he extends his hand she just kind of looks at it and looks at him and helps herself in because like that transference that touch like especially traditionalists back then it's like wouldn't just take a white man's hand you know <laughs> so there was that that i was playing with that was you know trying to maintain that aspect of molly and then when does that start loosening a little bit but just an actionable note that marty would give is like lily can you look like you like him a little bit more <laughs> 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 and um what's nice about that is like okay that's an action like and it allows the space for me to articulate what that would look like as molly you know it also clued me into how it was coming across on film so it was all very quick it was uh, not trying to get into my head, not trying to dictate my psyche to me, which is a very quick way to annoy me as an actor, as a director, is trying to tell me what my character is thinking. If if you plant a gesture and like just it, it, it gets across really quick what's not working and how to make it work. And that might go back to Meyer hold, you know, just scaling like level of uh level of interest in earnest it's like and proximity to earnest like what does it look like at a 10 what does it look like at a two and then where are we in our journey and um 
but the the fire of whatever that attraction was was still there. It's just, you know, you give it more gas or you take it away. I'm always curious to ask, you know, what especially when it comes to a, a monumental project like this, do, what was the 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 last shot you shot as as, as Molly? And and because I, I get such a wide range, it's like, oh, it was a pickup, you know, it was my hand or something, or no, it was right. like this big monumental <laughs> thing. Uh, do you remember what your last shot was as, as as Molly? Yeah, and it felt very appropriate. It was that shot where it's just Molly and Ernest seeing each other after Molly has come out of the hospital and before he's gone in, just in that open field where they embrace and they just like lean their foreheads into each other. Like uh, when Ernest proposed, like Molly's answer was just to like to bring him close and to so that that um that moment we came back because we did need a pickup for that we didn't quite have the right wide shot frame and then getting into the car it felt like a nice way to end it because as abusive as that story was and as much as you could argue it not being real love it, it was still love and then that kind of moment where molly is processing because she's not being poisoned anymore she's not getting this cocktail of what was likely arsenic and morphine talking to the family she was breaking this addiction that she didn't even know she had and you know her subconscious mind had joined with her conscious mind a bit and she was putting it together but just uh when she's kind of standing strong on her own two feet and giving herself the insulin and talking about having a dream where like she and Ernest went to a river and he dumped all of his secrets in and they just washed away and then we were happy you know just that there's there's one little realm where that genuine love between the two of them untouched by everything that happened still lived and that's kind of what that last moment felt where it's just prairie and just these two yeah it felt like a nice it felt like a very appropriate way to end it yeah that's one of the more meaningful ones my answers to that question of god i really have to be like oh i don't know i think it was like a shot of my shoe or something that feels that feels <laughs> well, like you really, know uh, appropriate the time. last shot was one of those inconsequential <laughs> moments so it was it was nice to get that call that we had to come back and get a pickup of that scene mm. and um one of our producers said like yeah i think we just kind of did that so because it, it would have been really sad to have ended the whole thing on just like a little pickup of somebody walking out of a door you know love that so as we sort of, you know, wrap up here, you mentioned, uh, and, and we've talked about so many different, you know, things you've learned and things you picked up, you know, you, you seem like an actor who really just adds to their, to their toolbox as, as you go on. You, <laughs> and you mentioned that, you know, each character kind of, you know, teaches you new little things. So I'm curious as you, as we're, as we move forward past Killers of mm -hmm. the Flower Moon, I'm curious what Molly, you know, taught you as an actor, you know, what did this experience, what did this experience add to your, uh, your toolbox? I think... It really gave me a, the lesson that, you know, you're always taught respect the other actor's process. Mm -hmm. um, there's when you're going through a training program and everybody's getting the same curriculum at the same time, it's like you're all applying the same methods and the same work at the same time. Mm -hmm. And it feels like you would think that everybody being on the same page creatively and in, in their process would make for the best scenes. But I feel like Leo and I had such complementary but not similar processes into our characters. And I think us as actors and how we approach the work was very akin to how Ernest and Molly both approached the world from these two different worldviews. And I think that really you would you would suspect that like you might get frustrated with each other. And I think early on, we didn't quite understand what the other one was doing to get in there. But then when the camera was rolling, the character was there. Mm -hmm. um, but like the conversation about how to do so, because Leo's very demonstrative. He's like getting it out before going on. And sometimes I do that depending on what the character I'm playing is. But with Molly, it's like I kept her very shrouded and close to the chest until the camera was rolling. I wasn't going to show any indication of how I was getting there. I was like, it felt like I was protecting her. And it felt like I was carrying her under my coat close to my chest like a baby until it was ready to bring her out and show her. So I think, um, yeah, that initial just learning to trust that each of us, even though we didn't recognize what the other one was doing to prepare and get in character, 
it helped. And I think it was kind of the heart of the chemistry was these two seemingly opposing processes working on screen together. It was really, it was really heartening and it was really lovely. And it just reinforced how powerful that stillness of Molly in contrast with just the, the shiftiness and the duplicity and the, um, the nature of Ernest, like that was nice. And we had, we had such a good time. That's beautiful. Lily, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for talking oh, to thank us. Thank you. For, thank for, you, Vinny. For being on our cover. I'm so excited. Uh, <laughs> Me it too. Is, it's truly a, a monumental performance. And I, I, I cannot wait to see what happens with it and what happens next. We will be, you know, us here at Backstage will be following very closely. Awesome. But thank you so much for being here. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Likewise. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter, at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next to let us know? Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.